Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. A Lifetime Seeking Peace, featuring Kathy Kelly. Kathy Kelly is a lifelong pacifist and peace activist. In her efforts to stop the U.S. military machine, she has traveled to war zones around the world, engaged in countless acts of nonviolent civil disobedience, and been arrested dozens of times. With her own eyes, she has witnessed the brutal costs of U.S. aggression. Her reality has focused on things that most U.S. citizens don't even know are happening, because the mainstream media and the political establishment studiously avoids talking about them. She knows about the children who are killed or maimed, and she speaks up for them. Despite being witness to such horror, she is not full of despair and does not believe that humans are intrinsically evil. She is clearly guided by love. I was so grateful for the chance to talk to her, as I have admired people like her my whole life. To me, such people are heroic. Not sports stars or politicians or soldiers, but the rebels with causes the justice seekers, the truth tellers, and the rabble rousers. In our conversation, we talked about International Women's Day, which happened to be the date of the interview, women's rights and the politics of peace, the brutality of war, how most U.S. Americans are ignorant of the consequences of U.S. militarism, the effects of using drones and special forces, her visits to Afghanistan, the 30th anniversary of Desert Storm, the original U.S. military attack against Iraq, what she learned on a visit to the Russian Federation, how militarism has become, quote, the main religion in the United States right now, the connection between U.S. imperialism abroad and the repression of Native Americans domestically, her experiences in prison, the subject of prison abolition, and what keeps her inspired as an activist. If you like this episode, please share it on social media and subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. To support this work financially, you can make a one-time donation to username Colibri at paypal.me or at Venmo. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. You can also become a member at patreon.com slash Colibri, where you'll get early access to new episodes, exclusive digital content, and goodies mailed to you. Here, then, is my conversation with peace activist Kathy Kelly. First of all, thank you so much for um, agreeing to spend some time talking to me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, sure, sure. And uh, today, uh, I thought we should mention what today's day is, first of all, because today is International Women's Day. And Mm -hmm. this isn't really a big deal in the United States, but it is around the rest of the world. And it goes back to, I believe the first one was in 1909 or so. And it was uh, a socialist holiday to begin with. And uh, maybe did you did you want to say anything about International Women's Day? Well, it was it was lovely to wake up this morning and have a message from a young friend in Mongolia and another from Kabul, uh, and a few other messages celebrating International Women's Day. And I think, you know, increasingly we're recognizing that we also have to have to more or less invoke the um, connection between Earth Day, I suppose, and Mother Earth and International Women's Day, because we really have a big responsibility to protect the planet from ourselves, really. And also, I think of so many people in war zones and in refugee camps and in prisons, and how hard it is for mothers and children in those circumstances. So it's a very important day. Um, I'm I'm glad I I didn't realize that it was a socialist holiday. (laughs) Uh Wonderful to learn. Thank you. 
Yeah, so the, uh, the, the Soviets were the first, I believe, to recognize it as a, an official national holiday, like one of the first nations to do so. And they, um, women gained the right to vote there in 1917, like basically as soon as the revolution happened. So, I, I mean, I learned all of this just in the last couple of days looking it up. But <laughs> Wow. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. And, and definitely it's also, of course, been uh, mentioned by many um, people that war and peace are women's issues for sure. Well, you know, it's, it's there's a very fascinating story um, from the United Kingdom. There were um, a mother and uh, two daughters, the Pankhurst women, who were adamant about getting the right to vote as suffragists in the United Kingdom. But the issue of going to war completely divided that family. The mother and one of the sisters said, well, now we must kind of hop on the bandwagon of supporting our country going to war, and uh, we'll pick up with our feminist efforts later. And the other sister said, no, 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 this war is going to be disastrous for entire generations all around the world, and it's a wrongful war, and it's being engineered and manipulated by people with interests that aren't, you know, that can't be combined with women's interests and children's interests and and they never spoke together again that divide lasted wow. but it, it did sort of work for getting the the right to vote for the suffragists in the in england because the government then did feel i, I suppose a bit indebted to them uh, but i think we have to really hold the line and say that war is never ever uh, an endeavor that can have a humanitarian Quality. And people keep trying to say it all the time. You know, we have this responsibility to protect. Well, war you know, wrecks the earth and destroys families and uh, creates desires for retaliation and ongoing revenge. There's, there's nothing that could be called humanitarian about it. Yes. And also, I've seen figures that show that over the course of the 20th century and up till the present, the number of casualties in wars who are civilians has been constantly on the rise this whole time. Yeah, and, and, and the, the weapons just get more and more hideous and grotesque. And they, they, they talk about, you know, laser guided weapons as though they can just pinpoint exactly who their target is, but that's not what happens. And again and again, we find villagers, you know, just uh, decimated and disemboweled and dismembered, decapitated by these weapons. And then when people come to try and save the survivors and bury the dead, there will be another wave of using the same weapons. The Saudis have done that with U.S. weapons in several places in Yemen. Um, there's a very stirring uh, narrative about it by Jeffrey E. Stern that appeared in the um, New York Times cover magazine in December of 2018. And he sort of traced the trajectory, the journey, if you will, of a bomb that was made at a Raytheon factory in Arizona and then hit people who had just been celebrated because they collectively pooled their meager, meager resources to dig a well because they were, they were thirsting and their crops were failing and their livestock were dying and they needed water. And they hit water and so they were celebrating. And they'd heard that sometimes the Saudis were hitting wells but they thought well we're, we're so remote we're so far away no one's ever going to hit us out here they're not going to waste a bomb on us but they were wrong and the saudi warplane fired a, a paveway missile so the way one of these weapons works it's it's dropped from a warplane and it dangles on a fuse but once the fuse is cut then the weapon sort of comes to life it sprouts three fins and it is laser guided and in this case, it was guided right to the spot where the celebration was breaking up. It was in the wee hours of the morning. And um, the author of this article says that he more or less traced the journey of a bomb from the Raytheon factory in Arizona right to the cheek of a man he was interviewing. The man was a survivor of the terrible bombing, and he told the story of what had happened. and. 
He said every day ever since, he, he constantly is in pain. He has terrible headaches. He uh, is badly injured in one of his legs and can't walk properly. And then he took Jeffrey's hand and put it on his cheek. And Jeffrey could feel the metal that was embedded under his cheekbone and his forehead bone and in his jaw. And so he had traced the journey of a bomb from a factory in Arizona to the cheekbone of a man who thought he had something to celebrate. And, uh, you know, I, I think that story is important because it's it makes the human reality so clear in terms of what happens in times of war. Uh, yeah, here in the United States, we're really insulated from hearing about these these stories or seeing these kinds of images. Well, and something that really surprised me over the weekend was to learn that the Saudi government hires consulting firms, not anywhere near D.C. right now, but in um, Maine, North Carolina, Des Moines, Iowa, and the idea is that they want to sort of um, repair the image of the kingdom and of Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince. And so they're going to areas where they presume people really don't even know there is a war in Yemen, never heard of it. And then they don't have to work against that. And then they perhaps also hope they don't know that the crown prince had murdered Jamal Khashoggi. So... Um, I, I think it is a good idea for people to try to understand one another and listen to one another and get to know one another, but not to lie and cover up and uh, pretend away the fact that a country is being bludgeoned and pushed to the brink of famine by another country and U.S. weapons are being used to do this. Right. And right before the Trump administration uh, was over, they, they decreed, I saw a story about this, about how... How Yemen was to be designated a foreign terrorist That's right, that's right. Yemen, forgive me, the Houthis. Right. Or the Ansar Allah is, is actually what they are called, and Houthi is a, sort of a, a term for many of the people that are um, a large contingent, but they, they actually are... Um, more formally called Ansar Allah. Well, that um, that designation was put through even though every um, human rights and humanitarian relief group that I'm aware of working with regard to Yemen that wasn't a specifically Saudi or Kuwaiti or UAE group had, had really begged the U.S. State Department, do not do this. But... Um, Mike Pompeo, then the Secretary of State, said, no, we're going ahead with this. But I have to give credit to the Biden administration. Normally, it takes about two years to undo that foreign terrorist organization designation. And it would have put in place uh, tremendous bureaucratic complications for getting desperately needed food and fuel and medicine distributed in the country of Yemen. But um, the Biden administration uh, managed within the second week, I think, of Biden being in office to say, you know what, we're, we're not going to go ahead with that. We're, we're not going to uh, put that through. And they were able to stop it. But now the Saudis are claiming, well, see what you've done. Now the Houthis are uh, more aggressive. They're more deliberate in um, being... Uh, how would you put it, in in attacking uh, places like Aramco in Saudi Arabia and using drones to do it. And and I hope this that the, there won't be any more proliferation of drones or of these horrible paved way missiles. I mean, now the, the Iranians do know how to make those, and they wouldn't mind selling them, I'm sure. But I, my hope is that somehow we can get a grip on this and pull way back really fast. Uh, I think weaponized drones ought to be banned by treaty and, and no one in the world should have them. Right, right. Absolutely. And this 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 is one way it seems that the United States has been seeking to continue its belligerent policies abroad, but not get as much 
um, not get as much protest at home is by using drones because then you don't have U.S. soldiers on the ground over there. And then also by using um, special operations. Well, that's the combination, I think, very worryingly that um, President Biden had recommended when he was vice president. He called it counterterrorism plus. And he said he felt the combination of special operations forces and drones would um, enable the United States to go after uh, the people that they, that they would designate as the, the people who shouldn't exist anymore, I guess. And I think that you can certainly see in Afghanistan that the reliance on the special operations forces has uh, exacerbated horribly the, um, the the levels of corruption, the um, spread of, of weaponry, and the sense that the only real way to get a job in the country is to align yourself with one militia or another and be willing to carry guns and be willing to kill one another. And, and this has led to horrific consequences. And also with the special operations um, groups, there's um, there, there have been some terrible and gruesome human rights abuses, not only from U.S. troops that are over there, but also Australian troops. And it, it seems that it's it's much more difficult to monitor what, what's happening with these special operations groups. Right. Now, you yourself have visited Afghanistan, haven't you? About 30 times. Okay. I, Can... I, I'm really fortunate, Colibri. I, I got to know... Um, youngsters primarily because we were doing a fast to close Guantanamo and it was a yearly event that happened in Washington DC I think that year we were fasting for 12 to 15 days I'm not quite sure um, and we found out that a group of teenagers were staying in a pup tent on a mountainside in a province a rural province of Afghanistan and they were fasting with us. <laughs> so we were able to connect with them through, through a phone call. And um, I remember my friend Carmen Trotta, some of your listeners might know of him because he's in prison right now as one of the Kings Bay Plowshares 7. But he said, well, you know, it's Martin Luther King's birthday. Maybe I could you know, tell them who he is and give him a quote or something or give them a quote. For it. I said, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Do, do that. So yeah, we were using a microphone, and Carmen started to talk about Dr. King, and there was a, definitely a reaction over there and in Afghanistan. And then we learned that uh, they not only knew who he was, they had memorized some of his quotations. And so one of the youngsters was giving us a quote. And I thought, well, you know, I have a lot of respect for uh, Bacha Khan, the uh, Muslim Gandhi, but you know, if somebody asked me to deliver a memorized quote in, in another language, I don't really think I could do it. So we thought, gee, we'd like to meet these kids, and and it, it became possible. I I um was I was very very grateful. I, we were able to go to their province, and uh, then they all moved to Kabul, and after that the. the their group was called the Afghan Peace Volunteers, and uh, they really accomplished uh, some some very brave and um, uh, creative projects. Maybe one that I could mention is uh, that mm -hmm. it's not easy to be a woman in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, in many, many families and uh, villages, especially in the rural areas, you know, once you are past puberty, your life is a life of service to your own family, eventually to your husband, to your husband's family, to your sons. And uh, there's there's nothing like, you know, uh, a, a sense of liberation for women to to pra to pursue their dreams and goals. And, and the education has gotten better, particularly in the city areas. But anyway, these young men... Um, felt that uh, they shouldn't continue practices that, that had you know showed so much inequality and discrimination. And so as a symbol of their willingness to willingness to try to empathize 
with women, um, they agreed to wear the burqa. And I thought they were just going to do it in the backyard, you know, and just walk around in it and kind of what get. They organized a public demonstration of men fully clad in the burqa. And the burqa is the sort of steel blue um, uh, covering, which it, it, it's put overhead, and then you have a mesh net in front of your eyes. But otherwise, there's there's no way anybody can see who you are. And it's, it's quite difficult to navigate in if you're trying to hold a child's hand and have groceries and, you know, it's a windy day. But there they were, these young men with, you know, obvious men's feet visible under the burqa, and they per- proceeded to pro- to form a procession. Well, um, the repercussions were so great that uh, a, a film of it had gone out on Facebook, and that had to be taken down right away, and one young man's family disowned him, and another's his father clobbered him when he got home, and there were uh, some of the religious clerics had issued condemnation. So the whole center that the young people had had to shut down for about two months. But I thought that was a very, very brave action. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I I hadn't heard about that. I hadn't heard about that at all. <laughs> um, the Afghan people. The, uh, tried also to uh, do their own kind of surveillance. Of course, they're not using drones, but they use, um, you know, like uh, notepads and pen and go uh, up the mountainsides. They have to uh, sort of pick their way up and down the mountain. Uh, But the questions that the young people then ask are questions like, how often does your family eat beans? Uh, nobody's getting meat, or you know, but, but beans would at least be some protein. And what's your source of income to pay the rent? And who earns that income? And if the income earner is a child, somebody under the age of 12, then they sort of put that survey on the top of the pile and, the, and they do their best to try to get people in those families in, in a situation where either the children can uh, get uh, donations of rations by going to a street kids school, or the women can manufacture heavy blankets and be paid a living wage for doing it. Now, in this year with the um, COVID and the pandemic, uh, I, I don't know that they're going to uh, continue with that. But um, meanwhile, the, uh, another group, the Jesuit Refugee Services, has uh, been serving the needs of people in refugee camps in similar ways. Right. So when you were in Afghanistan, you were meeting with different activists and just different citizens just to see what was going on? or You know, almost every trip, I was uh, staying with this group of teenagers in a um, working class neighborhood. Very seldom in the last five years of my travels there was I going outside because it would have endangered them really to have a Westerner there. Uh, and so I would, um, you know, keep myself uh, pretty well covered in a cab going from the airport to that home. But then kids poured into this center, and it was there. There were many, many opportunities to get a glimpse of how people were doing and what their concerns were just by listening to people who came and, uh, and, and to the people with whom I was living. Uh, So I didn't, uh, I didn't go around to other offices or organizations very much, but in the beginning, when we first started to go over, we did do much more of that. Um, And there were, there were some very, very admirable groups trying very hard to, to meet human needs. Uh, one of the most interesting, I think, is a group called Skatistan. And they set up a huge gym and taught kids how to do skateboarding. And they, they managed to teach the girls, too. And this this gym was, was set up in an arena that used to be a really frightening place because the Taliban used it to um, have public punishments of people. So it was symbolically... Um, and and that's, that project is still going. Mm-hmm. 
I wanted to go back a little further in time. Uh, you recently wrote an essay um, that was marking the fact that we just hit the 30th anniversary of Operation Desert Storm when the United States first invaded Iraq in uh, 2001. And you were there when the hostilities began. Uh, well, um, I should mention that um, the 30-year mark is from 1991, when we first invaded with Operation Desert Storm. And uh, I had, you know, probably at that point in my life, some ability to find Iraq on the map, and <laughs> I could find Kuwait, and I knew they spoke Arabic, and that I quickly would have exhausted everything I knew about Iraq. But I did know that it was highly unlikely that the United States wanted to a go to war against Iraq because it couldn't tolerate one country invading another. We had just invaded Grenada and invaded Panama and we'd supported all kinds of dictators in Central America. So it was clear that the United States had another kind of motive for going to war. And so I learned about a group that wanted to interpose itself in between the warring parties. And you know, the idea that you know, if you send soldiers, they risk their lives, and well, why not send peace people and say, you know, we, we want to stand up for disarmament. So um, I applied, and, and I was kind of, my nose was out of joint because I didn't get accepted right away. And I thought, well, gosh, I just did a year in prison for protesting nuclear weapons. Or what kind of street cred do you need for this group? <laughs> um, but then I was accepted and uh, went over and we quickly uh, got down to this camp. It was really on the border, uh, just uh, walking distance of the border between Saudi Arabia and uh, Iraq. It, w it would have been a, like a way station for pilgrims on their way to Mecca inside of Saudi Arabia. And so um, there were already were, you know, the, the basics for a camp, uh, like a, um, a stall with a corrugated tin roof and but we had to, you know, dig latrines and pitch tents, and uh, there was access to some electricity. And then um, the the Iraqis were able to um, guarantee one person who was a driver with us to, that he could get passage to a market and bring food. But then when the war started, it, it just increasingly seemed like all bets are off. And so uh, two weeks after the war had begun, which was on the, the war began on uh, January 17th. I remember it was three o'clock in the morning and we heard the warplanes flying overhead and they were flying so often. We, we started to think, well, is there going to be anything left of the cities that they're bombing? Um, and every dog in the area started barking. And those dogs, you know, they'd never heard such sounds, I'm sure. Those dogs barked themselves hoarse. Um, and I always thought that was an appropriate response to the beginning of that war. You know, the, the coalition that George Bush Sr. had put together uh, managed to line up miles and miles and miles of every kind of imaginable weapon in the ports, in three different port cities in Saudi Arabia. And then they just, you know, proceeded to to pound and pummel the people in Iraq who couldn't control their government. You know, it's not like they had some say so about Saddam Hussein. So then, two weeks into the war, um, I believe the the reality was that the Iraqis no longer wanted to be out there uh, at the nearest checkpoint or military base. And if they left without us, basically, you know, they could be leaving us to die in the desert because we didn't have an independent access for food or for medicine. Um, so we were evacuated to Baghdad. Not everybody was um, willing to get on the bus of their own accord. And, and I was so impressed by how gently the Iraqis responsible for this evacuation, you know, they've got orders from a dictator and they've got a timetable and they've got 12 people saying, well, we're not going to get on the bus. And they're, you know, sitting holding signs that say we choose to stay. And um, I, I thought, oh, you know, 
these guys are going to go ballistic when they understand. But it was just so touching. The Iraqi civilian in charge of this was accompanied by another civilian and two soldiers. And the civilian, his name was Tarak. He walked up to the tallest man sitting in that circle, bent over him, kissed him on the forehead, pointed to the bus and said, Baghdad. And then they very gently picked him up, hoisted him up. And he was a heavy man because uh, he was so tall. And they carried him over to the top step of the bus, placed him down. And then Tarek said, Mr., you okay? And that's how they proceeded to evacuate the other 11 in that circle. And then we were taken to Baghdad. Um, and along that road, we saw vehicles that were burnt and bombed. And it was pretty clear that as we got closer to Baghdad, the road was the only way out for refugees and the only way in for humanitarian relief. And um, all journalists, except for Peter Arnett and maybe a couple others, had left. Um, and so we found an old abandoned typewriter. And uh, when I was in prison, I actually realized that if you can't get a typewriter ribbon, you know, because in those days you had ribbons in typewriters, you could put carbon paper in front of another piece of paper. Now, you're nodding your heads, so we're dating ourselves yeah, here. Because if you tell your friends about carbon paper, they'll laugh. But if you do that, you can get a, an impression and you can type a document. So we were typing with a candle melted onto the typewriter because it's pitch black and we can't see. And there, we were in a hotel that didn't have a whole lot of windows. And so uh, I'm typing this message that we wanted to give to if a reporter were to be interested uh, to tell about what we were there for. And um, anyway, uh, in came an Iraqi official and he said, excuse me, madame, but could you type something for us? And I thought, well, gee, we'd have to see it first. Uh, and well, it was a letter to the then Secretary General of the United Nations um, and it was asking him to please protect that one road that was the only way out for refugees and the only way in for supplies. And so we thought, well, yeah, we saw the bombed out cars. That, that road should be kept safe. So we said, yes, we would type the letter. So there I am, an extra national from a country that's pounding the daylights out of Iraq, typing on an abandoned typewriter by candlelight with red carbon paper in order to make the impression. And, you know, we're supposed, in the United States, people are supposed to be somehow afraid of this country <laughs> that didn't even have a typewriter in the office of one of their cabinet level ministers. So, you know, the. The, the idea that George Bush Sr. could say, we will never stand by and let a larger country swallow up a smaller country, is it was such hypocrisy, because that's just what the United States did and it continued to do all through the horrible economic sanctions years, all through the 2003 shock and awe bombing, the utterly inept occupation that led to civil war and the rise of ISIS. It's a, it's a very, very tragic, sad history. Was that highway that you're talking about the notorious highway of death that we heard about? No, that was a different one. The highway of death would have come from Kuwait. You know, the right. Iraq invaded Kuwait, and that was an illegal invasion. I would certainly not hesitate to say that. But they did it with a lot of young conscripts. And so when it be became clear that um, the United States uh, was uh, quickly unboxing them in, they, they tried to flee, but they were literally boxed in on that road. And then by air, the United States Air Forces started to um, fire missiles at the vehicles that were in basically a big, huge traffic jam. They weren't going anywhere. 
And some people had managed to run away and run into the nearby towns or perhaps you know disappear themselves in Basra, which would be the city closest. But there were people that were killed and burnt in their vehicles. And then there was also a trench in between the two countries. And um, there were people at um, posts in that trench. And they were, I'm sorry to say, buried alive. Big bulldozers pushed the sand over them. So that was the highway of death. Right. Did you uh, yourself have any experience talking to people or um, witnessing anything that had happened in Fallujah? Oh, the first time I went to Fallujah, we had uh, what we call the magic sheet. This was in 1998, I believe. And our magic sheet was in English and in Arabic. And it told that we were people who came to Iraq to break the economic sanctions that we believed those sanctions were wrongful, and so we were delivering medicine and food to children in hospitals and uh, you know, kind of affirmed that we believed we were all part of one another. So we went to Fallujah, uh, and we were in a very big marketplace, and we, uh, we just wanted to pass out this sheet to people, and, um, and people surrounded the person with the camera, and I got separated, and... It was kind of, I wouldn't call it a mob scene, but it was a chaotic scene. And then one man came up to me, and he was livid, and he spoke English, and he's, he, he was shouting. And he said, you Americans, you Europeans, you come to my home, I show you water, you would not even give your animals to drink. And this is all that we have. And um, I... I remember just sort of murmuring to him, I'm sorry, I'm so very sorry. And I might have given him that little sheet of paper, the you know, magic sheet. But anyway, then he looked at me in just a completely different way. And he said, ah, madame, you are too tired. You come with me, I get you tea. And then he took me by the elbow, and the next thing I knew, there was a very, you know, kind of almost like primitive little uh, tea shop. It was just like a, a, a bench and a, um, a, a bar, a, a wooden bar. And he had gotten for me this very lovely kind of tea called Nume Basra. And, uh, and then he helped me find the rest of my team. And that's the kind of forgiveness we experienced again and again. But now, when I think about Fallujah, oh my goodness, you know, there were four uh, mercenaries, in a way, I guess would be the way to describe them, who had been killed. And I think they were burned in effigy. And then after that, the United States really um, hit Fallujah with many, many weapons. And there's also been a concern about depleted uranium uh, in Fallujah. So I, I, I have to say, I, I had hoped that when the Pope went to Iraq, uh, he would not only seek to unite Muslims and Christians, but that he might also seek uh, from the Western uh, nations that had participated in, in, in all of the wreckage caused by the coalitions that bombed and invaded and occupied Iraq um, seek a word of atonement. Right. And, and perhaps beyond, I mean, in addition to the words, also reparations at this point. Well, that's what I would certainly call for. And you know, I, I wrote that in the essay you mentioned, and someone was really angry with me when he said, you know, how can you talk about reparations? That's ridiculous. They, there's so much corruption over there. No one could ever supervise the reparations. It's completely unrealistic. And I'm not so sure that's true. I, uh, You know, I, there are, um, first of all, new a new generation is growing up in Iraq, and it may be that there's a more readiness, at least I've heard this from some friends, to start setting aside the retaliatory violent divisions amongst people. 
And, um, you know, the United Nations has many agencies that work in different parts of Iraq. And I don't think we should just be dismissive of all non-governmental organizations or UN efforts. Um, it, 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 it would certainly be a big demanding task to um, to help Iraq truly reconstruct. And to my mind, they, they'd be better off if they weren't so dependent on oil and could begin to cultivate other parts of the economy. I'd certainly say the same with regard to Afghanistan. But when you think about the huge amounts of money that we put into war, I mean, it's in the trillions now between the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, I think that it becomes possible to imagine, re, you know, you could start with rebuilding the healthcare infrastructure and healthcare delivery in Iraq. It's in horrible shambles, a, a horrible shambles now. Um, and then assist people to rebuild schools, uh, help people to get the technology that they would need to do education all across the country. I mean, I think that there are ways to start, um, but not if we put any of it under the rubric of militarism. Right, right. Um, I wanted to switch to, and, and talk a little bit about Russia because I saw that you had visited um, Russia during one of the NATO buildups of military along their borders. Um, to, to hear what Russian people thought about that. And I I mean, I would love to hear what, 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 what you saw there and, and what you heard, because we didn't hear, we don't hear the, you know, the Russian side of anything here, of course. Well, I felt um, a great deal of, um, what would I, um, sort of, I hadn't realized how little I knew um, about the ways that Russian people had suffered through World War One and World War Two. I remember being in St. Petersburg, and at the time that I'm thinking now, it was called Leningrad, and and I suppose you know I could I knew there okay the siege of Leningrad, but I didn't realize how desperately people had suffered and how many people had been um, had, hadn't survived and um, it was also very impressive to me that they took the time and the effort to preserve seeds they preserved their seed heritage even through that terrible state of siege but anyway walking through uh, a, a park that was dedicated as a memorial to the people who died during the siege of Leningrad was very moving to me I also was impressed by how much people have rebuilt following the decimation of um, of the wars, and uh, it seemed that uh, there's um, a, a true desire to connect with people from other countries, and a, and an unhappiness over a sense of isolation. Um, I'm I'm. I'm sure people didn't feel entirely free to speak their mind or to interact. I know that there are people that are considered minders and who would be keeping an eye on people. Um, and I was grateful for a, a chance to meet with a, a, a young Quaker who um, was very candid and forthright with us, but we, we needed to be careful not to cause him any any trouble or unwanted uh, like government oversight. So um, I, there there it was a lovely trip in many many ways. Just being able to um, see families enjoying themselves on the sea coast and uh, but the thing that most impressed me was how how little I recognized in the past the enormous um, sacrifices that had been exacted from the Russian people to fight against uh, the German powers. And, you know, so few people realize that the United States was allied with Russia in World War II. Um, and then I think, I, 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 you know, there's just such sadness that, that both Russia and the United States would be entering into a new Cold War and 
China and the United States entering into a new Cold War and spawning all manner of proxy wars, because these Cold Wars, are, especially in the context of of climate catastrophe, we need to be figuring out how we can work together, how we can collaborate, how you know we can identify the problems we have in common, throw in the pandemic as well. It, it doesn't make any sense to be concentrating on how we can build up more weapons than the other and target those weapons to menace and bully one another. And I think it's the United States that's driving that. Um, but we'll find out, I think, that it, it, particularly in China, the capacity to um, uh, outmaneuver the United States uh, war making could be quite great because um, they don't have 800 bases all around the world that they have to sustain. And um, but it, I think it's so foolish to drive countries into taking their resources that they need for feeding their populations and uh, coping with droughts and climate catastrophe and pandemic and and keep pushing saying no no you better buy some more weapons because we're going to get them first i'm really glad you brought up the environment because um so many people don't see the strong connection between the environment and militarism and it exists in you know at least a couple of ways one that you mentioned there that as long as the united states is acting as the world's bully and keeping everything stirred up that does prevent international cooperation and cooperation as you said is exactly what we need to deal with these global crises like climate change and environmental destruction that don't respect borders you know that this is where we do have to get together just as a species and and and, and tackle these together and um yeah, it's hard for the world to do that when the United States is behaving like this. And then secondly, there's the fact that's maybe a little better known that the Pentagon is the world's um, biggest institutional polluter. Right. When you think of how much fossil fuel is used just on one flight of one of those jets, it's just staggering. There's a, a very um, plucky movement up in Maine they they don't call it the National Guard, they call it the Maine Natural Guard. And uh, Lisa Savage actually ran a good campaign for Senate as a as a Green Party candidate. Um, they, I'm, I'm so sorry, I can't remember. It's, it's a way of voting so that if your first choice isn't going to have any possibility... Ranked choice then voting. That, that's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's how it was, ranked choice voting. And she... she um, I think had a, in many ways a successful campaign, not because she won, but because she was able to engage in so much outreach. And um, so she and her supporters have been um, promoting this idea of the main natural guard uh, to guard against the militarism that's so destructive of their environment. And uh, she's got one of the best anthologies I've ever seen listing all of the many, many articles that have been written about the connection between the military and the environment. Ah, okay. I'll have to ask her about that. I interviewed her for this podcast oh. last year when she was running. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Paula Regina, about this anthology that she has, because it's so thorough, and I hope she's got it continually updated. It was um, I, I was amazed at how much has been written and there's of course more being produced all the time now right right yeah and you know there's a lot of information out there obviously and there's also this problem of so little of it getting to to people you know and so i, I was hoping you might want to to make a comment about how about the role of the mainstream media in sort of um well in in, in not educating people enough about what's really going on? Well, I think that the the main religion in the United States right now has become militarism. Uh, and it, it, it seeps through into almost every aspect of our society. Uh, you know, if you walk into a university, you'll find all kinds of little plaques that say, this room is dedicated to Raytheon, and this room was enabled by Boeing. And you find military contractors who have 
plants and factories and companies all in, in every congressional district all across the United States. They're, they're, they're constantly moving into the communities and insinuating that you know, the military is really good for you. The military is good for all of us. And you don't find the U.S. media challenging that. In fact, often if you're looking at TV um, shows, it's constantly the generals that are invited to be the commentators uh, or the people that are, have for years defended U.S. militarism and cheered for U.S. militarism. Uh, and I, I think that um, the, the the ways in which militarization has entered into sports and entertainment is also served by the mainstream media. So that, you know, if it's halftime at a big game in an arena, now I know under the past year of pandemic, there hasn't been so much of that. But often, you know, you'd have some kind of military display and, you know, camouflage baby diapers. And, you know, we, we need our media people to, to question this um, kind of vice-like grip that the military increasingly has on education in our country. I, you know, I wanted to ask you a question um, that I um, I don't hear mentioned quite so often in in peace circles, which is uh, about the connection between U.S. imperialism and bra- abroad, and the fact that the U.S. is an imperial structure, uh, with the fact that uh, the United States itself is occupied territory, in terms of the fact that this is a settler colonial state, and so much of the land is stolen. And, you know, there are people who refer to the Indian reservations, for example, as prisoner of war camps, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, you know, I, the the attitude toward nature of the people who were the first invading uh People was 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 hostile, and there was this sense of um, nature being dangerous, and and so I think the 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 founding of the United States, the founding of the co- colonial um, places, was fraught from the beginning with just wrongful myths. This idea of you know superiority of the European colonizers, the idea that somehow. Uh, you have to conquer nature and battle nature. The idea that the indigenous people were um, somehow uh, not to be listened to and, and, and inferior when in fact they had learned ways to uh, to live on the land that were far more harmonious. And, and so the introduction of so much that was sick and diseased and wrongful and cruel into this land, and then the idea that that we should be exporting <laughs> our overconsumptive, bloated, racist way of life to other people—it's—it's it, it's just there, there's so much cruel wrongheadedness uh, embedded, I think, in in the psyche uh, and and in 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 our land. And and as I say that, I think well. I don't care about whether I'm being patriotic because I, I, I don't I, I like what Thomas Paine had to say. My country is the world. My religion is to do good. Um, and and I, I don't feel that uh, people are inherently evil by any means. But I do think that to some extent, people in the United States have acquiesced often to being like a nation of big children. Um, ready to sort of forfeit our adult responsibilities to better understand our place in the world and what effect we have on our planet and other people in the world. And, and, and not to go along with this idea of, you know, well, we have to protect ourselves with the war on terror. Uh, the greatest terror we all face is what we're doing to our own environment. And, um, and certainly what, what we've done to those who originally inhabited this land and to the many, many, many species that once could thrive has, has been uh, something terrifying, I believe, when, and, and 
sure, nobody wants to look in the mirror and see an ogre or see, you know, a, a menacing, bullying country. But if we want to be honest and we want to change, then I think we sometimes do have to take a look in the mirror and see our society as it has um, developed and, you know, take a look at the mass incarceration. I think a new prison was built once every 10 days in, um, the, in, the, in the 90s. Uh, I think we have to look at the ways in which uh, human caging and a sort of carceral state has created havoc for families all across the United States. And then again, you know, the, the idea of green lighting this kind of activity so that other countries say, well, if the United States can lock up so many people, I guess we can too. And, uh, you know, they see Guantanamo where people are not only detained without being charged, they're tortured. And so other countries say, well, if the United States can do it. So we find all these terrible practices being uh, imitative in some ways of what, what the United States has done. So we have a lot to learn from our brothers and sisters who are among the First Nations uh, and I think also from people like Muhammadu Old Slahi who was released from Guantanamo and yet in spite of all that he experienced, that young Mauritanian man who was held in Guantanamo for 13 years says, I refuse to hold a grudge. That's beautiful to hear. Yeah, it is quite wonderful. Yeah, it seems like much of your work has been about humanizing the face of of the effects of U.S. militarism. Mm. Well, I've been really fortunate, um, incredibly fortunate, to be able to live alongside uh, very hospitable, very welcoming people in some pretty extraordinary circumstances. I mean, I, I was with a family during the bombing of Gaza, uh, it was called Operation Cast Lead. And, uh, you know, when you're, when you're with a mom and a dad and, and, and two kids, you, you can get another sense for what it means for, you know, Apache helicopters to be flying overhead or, you know, drones firing. Uh, and, and so I'm very, very grateful to the many, many families that have welcomed people like me. Right, because I think this is something that this is certainly the side of things that Hollywood and the news doesn't show us is that, you know, uh, we have more in common with the people of these countries, the regular people of these countries, than we do really with billionaires in our own or our own leadership oh i think that's so important to realize i mean i think there was a time in my life when i i was washing dishes at a soup kitchen and and uh I, it was probably in conversation with somebody and, and we've we we said sort of exactly that we have more in common with the people that are coming into the soup kitchen to get a meal than we do with the billionaires that are ready to you know bomb the daylights out of the soviet union uh and the other time I certainly got that sense was when I went any time I've gone to federal prison and I realized, uh, you know, I don't know where they keep the bad sisters because I don't meet them. I have met women that could have been my next door neighbors, my co-workers, my in-laws. Uh, so, so I think that people do get sort of skewed senses of um, the, uh, people who are different from us and then they get kind of boxed and labeled and, and there, there's often a sense of, um, you know, the alien, but that's unnecessary. I mean, there's an artificial shortage of love in this world, but it's certainly artificially created. You know, it's not necessary. You, you've uh, you referred just now to being in a prison. You've been arrested uh, countless times. I have been arrested a lot, yeah. I, you know, a lot of the campaigns we did involved um, doing the action and then once we were released, going back and doing it again. So um, that uh, occasioned uh, quite a number of arrests. I've, I've been in actual prison 
three different times. And uh, I think the, the, the most onerous thing about the U.S. prison system is the length of sentencing. And I've only had short sentences. Uh, one year was the longest, and another sentence was three months, another sentence was four months. But gosh, when you're with women who've already served eight years or have 10 more years to go, it's 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 utterly heartbreaking, and and many are mothers, and and they they you know lament that their children, you know, won't remember what they look like. Uh, it's a very wrongful, wrongful, uh, merciless system. Right. I mean, it's very, it's this retribution, revenge, punishment way of of looking at at things. And go ahead. Well, and I was also going to say that um, I sometimes have a fantasy of standing up on a bench inside a courtroom and raising my voice and saying, could we just look and see who's making money off of this process <laughs> and who is paying for it? I mean, you know, every university all across this country graduates a new group of lawyers every year. So there's this huge number of people whose income will be earned through participating in a process that ends up putting other people in cages. And, you know, here in the Chicago area, the Cook County Jail, it, it looks like a gulag. It's just one of the most uh, awful stretches of brick imprisonment with coiled barbed wire all around it. Well, under COVID, there was a move to um, let a lot of people go but they weren't outside the control of the system. The, the prison population inside the Cook, the Cook County Jail went way down. But people were wearing um, leg irons, ankle monitors, and they were subject to many kinds of surveillance and policing. And, uh, you know, like somebody might be out, but then she couldn't, if she was a woman, uh, go pick her kids up at the school or go to the grocery store. So, but now... The prison population has gone right back up to where it was. So this means that we have almost like double the number of people that are under the carceral state, either actually living in cages or under so much surveillance that their their freedom is completely limited and other parts of the community are now being used, like social work or sometimes even education work, to enforce this sort of um, carceral system. So we really have to be careful. We need prison abolition, I think, but be careful of prison reform. Yeah, no, I, I agree that prison abolition is, is the way to go at this point. And I think a lot of people, uh, you know, are kind of shocked by that idea. But then when you look at, you know, the vast number of people who are in prison for very minor offenses, no violence, you know, that's often the reason we excuse it. Oh, they're violent. They need to be locked up. Well, so many, the vast majority of people didn't commit any kind of violence. And so, yeah, it does seem like it's, it's, uh, there's just so many economic factors behind it continuing. Well, when you think about what really most threatens our society, I, I, I think the main threats come from people who are manufacturing weapons, manufacturing firearms, manufacturing tobacco manufacturing um, all kinds of chemical substances that aren't very good for people. And you're not going to find people at the top levels of Boeing and Raytheon and um, general dynamics uh, being accused of having threatened other people or our society. But then, you know, read Jeffrey E. Stern's very compelling article about what happens when those products that they make are being fired at civilians in another land and it's vicious. And um, so, I mean, right now, the Boeing Corporation is selling 650, um, they're called SLAM ER missiles. They're laser guided missiles, standoff land uh, air uh, um, emer extended response missiles. And, and, and they're these guided laser missiles. Well, you know, there's the Boeing Corporation. It's contributing to the Lyric Opera in Chicago. They go into the high schools and help with STEM courses. You know, they do lots of things to make it seem like, you know, aren't we lucky? We've got Boeing's headquarters right here in Chicago. But um, it's one of the largest 
military contractors in the world. So I think that kind of thing under the International Criminal Court uh, should be considered illegal. But I don't want David Calhoun, the president of Boeing, or chief executive Boeing, of Boeing to go to prison. I don't want anybody to go to prison. But I do think rehabilitation ought to have to do with rehabilitating our relationship building actions that I think we need. Relationship building actions? Yeah, I think people need to build relationships in order to say, okay, we want to abolish the prisons. We have to put real effort into building relationships within communities that are predicated on fairness and justice and empathy and compassion. Right. I, I feel as though maybe the most, I've given this some thought too, and I feel like such efforts could be focused around um, necessities or essentials, like for example, uh, relocalizing uh, our food system, you know, for example, you know, like there's a lot of work that could be done there, you know, with um, urban farming, for example, you know, in the cities, you know, and obviously housing is another issue. It, it, it feels to me like that would be the easiest way to focus um, communities in this relationship building is around the things that we all need. Yeah, and I think, you know, retrofitting the housing stock so right. that uh, renewable energies can be used and um, decent, enjoyable child care, decent, enjoyable elder care. Uh, there are so many things that communities can do in order to create the kinds of relationships that are more fair. And then I think to to address the question, why why should we all accept the idea that one hour of one person's time can be worth 40 times more than one hour of another person's time. You know, when you think about it, if somebody's pulling food out of the ground, that's pretty valuable, essential work. Right. And if somebody is, you know, pushing paper on a desk and, you know, not, I, I just don't understand why we should agree that some people can be paid, compensated, you know, many, many, many dollars for their hour of their time. And others who have extremely valuable work uh, as well, or maybe more valuable, should be so un un miserably paid, uh, and, and that those exchanges can go on and everybody takes it for granted. Uh, so there's, uh, there's a lot to rethink, and it has a lot to do with rethinking um, the ways in which education sort of replace the divine right of kings. You know, um, uh, we don't have royalty in this country, although you'd have to wonder sometimes with the preoccupations of royals in other countries. But, but we, we sort of have allowed, I think, the idea of royalty to be replaced by this sense of um, entitlement related to education. And instead of just being grateful, like, gosh, you know, I had a chance to get educated, um, how can I give back? I think people use that as a way to say, I've got a, a, a chance now to um, take more from other people because I've already been so blessed. Right, right. So so over the course of, of, of your life and all your decades of activism, there's... Um, I mean, some things have gotten worse over, have continued to get worse over over the, over that time. The, the state of the environment has certain, certainly gotten worse. And when it comes to, well, U.S. military spending has gone up, you know, I think that since since 9-11, uh, the militarized state of the culture has certainly been worse. You know, I, I was born in 1969, and I, I consider myself a lifelong pacifist, and, and it was certainly different. Uh, in the 90s or the 80s than it is now, the atmosphere, you know, the atmosphere now is so much more uh, kind of repressive in all ways. Um, and I, I, I mean, personally, I don't feel like giving up on activism, despite all of this. And I'm, I'm sure you don't either. But I'm, I'm hoping you could sort of speak to that about why it is that you don't give up or, or what gives you hope or, or whatever, you'd, however you'd like to put that. <laughs> well, you know, 
Um, I, I know I'm looking backward quite a bit now, but I would say that in 2002, the world came closer to stopping a war before it started than ever before. Really close. So close that Tony Blair was in a panic in the UK saying to George Bush, you better get this war going because if the International Atomic Energy Association and the UN declare that Iraq does not have weapons of mass destruction, I'm not going to be able to get on board with this war. And so they, they just rammed through the 2003 shock and awe bombing in spite of massive, massive protesting. Now, how did people know anything about Iraq in countries like the United States, where the media had so suppressed any information about economic sanctions? Believe me, we tried every trick in the book with sending 70 delegations to break the sanctions and trying every which way to get the mainstream media to cover it. And finally, we realized it's just not going to happen. We have to kind of be our own media. Well, people, I'm going to go back a little further, people who had been very, very adamant, the United States is not going to invade Nicaragua or Guatemala or El Salvador. People had, in the 80s, a peace movement that was just determined, pledged, we're not going to let this happen. And that, I think, had transferred over into the, the capacity for a very strong resistance to the 2003 war. Now, once that war started, um, I know it is disappointing. I was in Baghdad at the time. I wish that the, um, the notion that many uh, practiced it during the Arab Spring demonstrations of holding the spot, you know, don't leave, stay in that square, and they did it at great risk to themselves. I wish that that, that, that had happened in the United States, that people who had gone out to demonstrate had said, you know what, um, it's right to demonstrate on Saturday, and it's still going to be right on Sunday and on Monday, and, on, and, and just really um, shut down as much as they possibly could with, you know, everyday activity saying, you know, you've got to subordinate this to this uh, incredible, uh, important matter of stopping this war. Anyway, people came close. And when I look at Black Lives Matter, the movement for Black Lives statements, when I look at young people uh, with Extinction Rebellion and other kinds of um, sometimes more spontaneous sorts of actions. I think that there we we might possibly be at a time when uh, people won't consume their main education about the world about them from um, the well-paid media companies, or, or sorry, the um, well-endowed media companies. I think we're going to find a time when there's much more grassroots uh, education and learning and outreach. I'm, I'm hopeful about that. I, I know the clock is ticking and we might feel like time is running out and we've done so much to abuse the planet already. It'll be, um, you know, very, very hard on some of the, the neediest people in our world. Um, but I don't, I, I don't see this as a time to give up by any means. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do my maiden voyage as an online teacher. I've never done that before, but uh, I'm learning. And uh, I, there's a, 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 a project called the School for Social and Cultural Change. And uh, so I'll be... Um, offering a course for eight weeks. And, and every day when I take a look at it, I think of new ways that that might um, become uh, more accessible, if you will, to people beyond the United States and in different parts of, of, of the United States. So I, but at the same time, I also think it's incredibly important that we undertake actions and uh, as the pandemic hopefully starts to lift, we uh, are back out in the streets, reaching out and and taking and, and keeping activism alive. Yeah, yeah, I certainly hope to see that see that too.
Well, thanks so much for spending some time talking to me today. I really appreciate it. And is there somewhere that people should go to like follow your work or any organizations you're involved in right now? Or, uh, Well, I'm very keen on um, World Beyond War. I think that that's doing great work. And uh, most of the time, if I write something, it'll go up on Counterpunch and Common Dreams and Antiwar.com and Truthout and other places. Um, we keep the Voices website alive, um, so you can kind of go there, but you would also there learn that we decided to close Voices for Creative Nonviolence as a campaign. Um, and then, as I say, there is this school, it's called sscc.teachable.com, and, uh, and anybody's welcome to, to participate in that. Um, uh, four of my young Afghan friends are going to join me in it, so I sort of hope that can be team teaching. One is in Mongolia, and one is in India, and two are in Kabul. So it's uh, it'll be a, a challenge to find a time for a joint Zoom call with people in that many different time zones, but I think we might be able to aim for uh, Saturday mornings. So. And thank you for your time, Colibri. It's been a p pleasure. And thanks so much. It's really, I, I consider it a real honor to talk to you, having been following your activism for at least 20 years. So thank you very much. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.